welcome to everybody. Um, it's so brilliant uh, to have this occasion tonight because this is our first time we've ever had a company in residence. Um, Moongate Productions as our second company in residence and it's just so brilliant to have you, to have had you in the building, but also to be talking to you tonight. Um, a short visual a description of myself, it's uh, I've got um, short dark hair and uh, wear glasses and um, a, a shirt with stars on it and I'm sitting in the box office at Omnibus Theatre right now and we've just had a big old flood so I've been uh, mopping up floors anyway um, but all is good and I just wanted to kind of set the context for a company in residence and um, it was something that I've been thinking about for a while and what's exciting about this prospect and we are this is, as I said it's the first time so we are going to be developing it with Body Politic and with Moongate Productions and it's really having an organization attached to, the, to, to us that is doing stuff like this, doing a takeover. So it's I, I do all the programming here and it's really fantastic to think that this is handing this space over to MJ to do the programming for this event and hopefully the beginning of, of more. So it's different voices, it's different, particularly different art forms. And I'm I was so interested when I first saw MJ's work, um, Father Figurine, I, I, I thought it was a really powerful piece of work. And I was really struck by how text and physical life was fused together as a particular kind of storytelling because my background is kind of mostly text led so I've got a great interest in this cross art form and, and different disciplines different vocabularies and I kind of want to get to know more about that and learn about that so part of you being here with us for a year is, is for me learning from you understanding your work as an artist supporting you and the company in whatever you know we can help with so that is like anything from arts council applications right the way through to marketing to space you know to whatever having a chat having a cup of tea it, it doesn't really matter it's it's led by the artist so that's the kind of you know in a year's time we'll be able to tell you more of what happened but right now that's the kind of beginning of it and so to start that kind of journey. I was just really interested in you, MJ, and, and understanding or learning about your kind of journey to where you are now as an artist and how you, you've come to this place, because I, I actually don't know. I have no idea. So <laughs> I'd, I'd love to know. <laughs> um, great. Thanks, Marie. Um, so I um, have always danced from a, a young age, um, but I actually went to university and did a psychology degree. Um, and it, uh, for a period of time, I wanted to be a speech and language therapist, um, but uh, realised that I had to do more studying. Uh, and by that point, I'd had, a, had enough of, of university life. Um, so, um, but during my time there, um, I studied at the University of Manchester. I got involved in kind of hip hop. Um, I used my student loan very well to take as many dance classes as possible um, and uh, kind of just I, I guess got the bug really. Um, it was something that was really different to what I'd done previously um, and just really liked kind of the freedom and, and uh, how yeah there was this kind of expression and, and kind of uh, feel of, of the movement and, and what I was learning that was so different to what I'd done previously. Um, so really, really got the bug, um, but actually graduated and went to work in a pupil referral unit. Um, I worked in early intervention, um, working with young people who were um, around kind of social emotional aspects of learning. Um, but in great times, I used to teach dance because uh, that's what they wanted to do. Um, and I think from there, it, it, kind of saw how much uh, a positive impact dance and, and the arts has has on young people and how it can really increase kind of self-confidence and self-esteem um, and I wanted to do more of that so um, from there I then worked at um, uh, Oxford Art Centre called Pegasus Theatre and my work was uh, predominantly around um, engaging 
and I hate the term, but at the time it was, you know, engaging vulnerable and hard to reach young people in the arts. And we ran programs that were um, dance and drama. Um, and it was about kind of bringing those young people on a journey where they then had something that they felt proud of. And they were learning new skills. Um, they were learning to explore difficult themes and challenging topics, but without actually, you know, that classroom environment, I think, for me, the education system doesn't necessarily work for every young person. And um, I certainly found that the arts was a real kind of vehicle um, that young people just kind of got swept along with. And, and that was such a beautiful kind of journey to be part of with them um, and to support them through that. So I guess from, from that kind of side of things, I was kind of working a lot with young people um, and then started Body Politic as a, I guess, producing events. We did a lot of kind of workshops with international choreographers and um, it was a, a very much at that point an events led organization, um, but there's not a lot of money <laughs> in, in it, um, especially with kind of the costs that uh, some of the choreographers were charging. So, um, I then kind of, you know, you strip all of that back and you realize that actually your, your interests and your passions lie with supporting young people and creating work together and, and collaborating. Um, and, and so, you know, that's what then led to body politics working um, to create work for the stage. We were involved in, um, Oh, I'm waffling on, I'm so sorry. Um, um, a platform at Pegasus Theatre called uh, Moving With The Times, which was a sort of, I guess, an early a career platform opportunity where you would um, kind of create a, a small snippet of work and, and, you know, perform it. And it was that, uh, you know, the first kind of venture that we did um, with that. And that then evolve, evolved to create a triple bill um, one of which Father Figurine being one of those pieces. Um, and that was kind of written um, by Isaac, who is in the audience. Hi, Isaac. Um, and he wrote the script and, and was really involved in that process. And Damien, who was a lighting designer at Omnibus Theatre. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's uh, it just kind of evolved really. And I think for me, what I've learned over the years is, is the the work is there's an organic kind of evolution of the work because you involve so many different collaborators everyone brings something so unique to the table and then it's kind of piecing that together to to create the best piece of work um that you can i think that's that's it and here i am that's today <laughs> So oh, great to hear all of that. I, and I want to hear more and more. So we'll have more chats uh, at, in the cafe bar when, uh, when I see you next. Um, thank you very much for that. And um, I'm going to now hand over to the next part of this evening and um, looking forward to seeing everything else. Thank you. And, and just, you know, I think it's really nice. Um, uh, to sort of add here that like Omnibus Theatre were the first ever venue that kind of you know, programmed Father Figurine and, and it's so lovely to see Damien in the audience because I remember walking into the theatre and and uh, sort of having having to kind of see the space and uh, me sort of not knowing because I've never done a tour before and us kind of figuring it out together. Um, and it's just so lovely to that relationship have come full circle. So thank you, Marie, for that opportunity. Um, I'm really excited about the next 12 months. Me too, me too. So we are now going to um, have a lovely panel discussion um, and I will kind of hand over to my three panellists um, in a second, but just to kind of add a, a little bit of context to why we're having this panel discussion tonight is um, Body Politic are creating a brand new all female led hip hop theatre work titled Them. And the themes of the piece are centred around misogyny, sexual violence against women and, and that trauma that we as women kind of hold on a, on a daily basis, be it through kind of experiences um, or those lived experiences. Um, and as an artist, as a, a creative, for me, it's really important that when you're creating a piece of work um, that, you know, you do your research, that you gather that information so that you're creating um, 
a really informed and sensitive piece of work, especially when it's around um, themes uh, such as, you know, um, sexual violence or consent. Um, and that is why kind of through research and involving these amazing collaborators in tonight's panel discussion, um, it's about kind of opening uh, that conversation. It's about having experienced experts in the room to kind of feed that narrative and, and to hopefully um, create a space where we can explore and discuss and be more informed and empowered to make those choices um, ourselves. Um, so I'm gonna hand over to um, our panelists, Sophie, uh, Deanna and Jocelyn. Uh, and um, so I will kind of, just double checking everybody's here. Uh, anyway, I'm gonna hand over to um, uh, Sophie and Deanna first to uh, Jocelyn's literally just arrived, which is wonderful, um, to perhaps just introduce yourself and the organization charity or the work that you are doing. Um, and yeah, Sophie, I wondered if we could start with you, please. Of course, yeah. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me tonight. Um, short physical description. I'm a white woman with pink, terribly dyed hair, tattoos and uh, blue earrings. Um, and I work for Oxfordshire Sexual Abuse and Rape Crisis Centre. I've worked there for, I think, uh, well, almost two years now. Um, and I work within the children and young women's um, area. So we work with young people between sort of ages of 14 and 18 who've experienced sexual violence and provide them with emotional support, well-being, counselling. Um, my role as an empowerment worker kind of covers everything that isn't that. So for example, this week, really excitingly, I get to help someone find a service dog um, and uh, help people with like housing and social benefits, that kind of thing. Um, I'm also a children's independent sexual violence advisor, which uh, means I can help people go through the criminal justice system if they choose to report what's happened to them. Um, also supportive if that's not something they choose. Um, so yeah, that's me. Do you want to um, say hello, Diana? Hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, short physical description. I'm a mixed race woman with um, long dark hair and I'm wearing an orange jumper and in the background is a row of books. Um, I am a poet, I'm a writer and I was welcomed to join this project um, with the Body Politic team. I'd worked with Lucy who is producer many, many years ago. And um, and when I got the brief through, um, it was it felt also felt like an invitation to speak on a period of my life that I hadn't um, that I just hadn't uh, found like a access point to kind of uh, share on. And so um, so I was yeah really glad to kind of have initial chats and feel like it was a safe space to create a piece of work that I finally felt I could give publicly as a as a safe gift to be looked at. So I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Deanna. Um, and Jocelyn. Hi, Jocelyn. I wonder if you could just introduce yourself and um, a little bit about the organisations that you work for as well. Well, greetings, everyone. Um, I'm Jocelyn Yeboah Newton, known as Jocelyn or Joss. Um, in terms of physical description, um, I'm a dark skinned woman um, who loves bold colors because they make me feel alive. So I'm currently wearing like um, a mustard yellow, looks kind of bright because there's ring lights going on, but a mustard yellow jumper um, and a big green and yellow head wrap. Um, so, so I'm very tired today, but I'm really thankful to be here this evening and with you all. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I'm a founder of a creative wellness series called Our Naked Truths. Um, and there we sent to the, <clears throat> the stories, the bodies, 
and the experiences and the reclamation and the joy of black and POC female identifying people and non-binary people where we invite muses to come and model for the first time completely nude, sharing their bodies and stories of self-acceptance and inviting us into the process. We meditate, we draw, we laugh, we cry. Um, and come into communion together, which is wonderful. We also run a um, wellness series with creative practitioners, anything from um, psychotherapists, drama therapists, um, working with tarot empresses and sound wisdom healers to really explore different tools that we can all tap into for the mind, body and soul. Um, and we run a podcast called The Communion where we invite muses back like a, a minimum of a year later to come and share what the process of acceptance looks like now for them and invite us back into their journey. Um, I'm also founder and director of the Black Women's Therapy Fund, um, where we provide free therapy and low cost therapy, um, usually 12 month sessions for the free therapy and low cost for as long as that, that person needs it to black women and non-binary people where they get access to a black practitioner. And we work with lots of different modalities. And it was really important for us to ensure that people knew that you don't just have to have CBT or psychodynamic therapy. You can access drama therapy, you can access art therapy. Um, you can access EMDR. Um, all of our practitioners are trauma informed, so they know how to handle the different aspects of our trauma and complexities. Um, and we also run a low cost side where we provide sessions with a practitioner where you can access therapy from anything from 15 pounds up to 45 pounds um, per session. And I also work for an amazing organization. I'm a gender consultant for an organization called Abianda. Um, and what we do is we support and advocate for young women and girls who have been impacted by criminal exploitation and county lines exploitation. Um, so I do a gender consultant, sounds a bit fluffy, I know. So I basically do a lot of advocacy for those young women, um, trying to inform legislation and policy changes um, at strategy meetings to make sure that young women's got the right support and we're thinking holistically about that support and a lot of training with prof professionals that serve those young women using our best practice, um, which is centered around solution focused brief therapy. Um, and I'm also studying at the moment um, to be an integrative psychotherapy, a therapist. So a little bit about me, really excited to be here um, with some powerful people doing amazing things. Um, and that's it really. Thank you so much. Um, I'm hoping you can still hear me okay. It's it started chucking it down here and I'm in my shed. So um there's a it's quite loud. So um apologies if you can hear the, the rain uh, in the background. Um so we're gonna dive into a panel discussion now. Um so I will kind of ask uh Sophie, Deanna, and Jocelyn questions. Um but please if there's anything that kind of um that you want to kind of chip in with, please kind of just shout. <laughs> um, so Sophie, I think it's, uh, we'll start with you, um, just to give a little bit of context perhaps, perhaps about victim blaming. I think it's a word that is um, bounded around a lot and perhaps uh, just having a little bit more information about what that means um, would be really kind of helpful for the beginning of our discussion tonight. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, yeah, it's, it's such a huge topic. I could talk about this for several hours and bore you all to death. Um, but yeah, at the, at the um, basically, uh, it, victim blaming is anything that um, blames the victim or the term that we use in Osaka as a survivor for what has happened to them. Um, so examples of that can be someone who was intoxicated at the time, somebody who was wearing certain clothes, um, anything along those lines basically and it's everywhere it's pervasive in society in almost all all aspects it comes from people's families it comes from the media it comes from um, yeah a lot of places around us so yeah that's pretty much what it's all about. And what impact does does it have on the young people that you work with? Mm. So the young people I work with, um, just to reiterate, as I said before, are between 14 and 18, and they've survived an incident of sexual violence. Um, so that usually means that they're in a position where they've been extremely traumatized, usually some sort of diagnosis of PTSD or um, something along those lines, and they're really seeking some help and support. Um, the way victim blaming affects them is in a lot of aspects so if, first of all they're um they, you, you can internally victim blame so if you have these ideas that you agree with that you've been taught since birth okay someone wears a short skirt and if something happens to them that's their own fault because of that and then something happens to them 
that internalizes that oh, well what happened to me was my fault and that's a huge huge thing to try and get over it's a huge huge um you know issue amongst the young people that I speak to you know there's a lot of what could I have done differently what should I have done differently how can I prevent this happening in the future and actually you know of course it's absolutely fine to talk about preventative work but at the same time like it's you know it, it's really sad to see you know um you know it breaks my heart to see young people kind of blaming themselves for surviving something absolutely atrocious um second of all it, it affects their support system so even if a young person hasn't internalized these ideas there's usually a parent or an adult person that maybe they've disclosed to that uh, will ask inappropriate questions like you know sort of what were you wearing did you try and fight the person off etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm. Um, and then that then makes them not feel believed um that you know i've told somebody that this thing has happened but actually it's not that big a deal because an adult has said that you know it was something that i did so therefore you know i shouldn't feel as bad as i do but i do feel bad um so that's kind of another aspect and also just society as a whole um you know stops it stops people from disclosing they think gosh well i was drunk when this happened no one's going to believe me no one's going to be on my side no one's going to um, understand what I've been through and understand how upset I am similarly mm. when I talk about the criminal justice system um, you know this victim blame is pervasive amongst everybody you know if it gets to the point of a trial where you know you've got the um, jury like if they have these you know inappropriate incorrect beliefs like that's not gonna that's gonna be part of the reason why so many um, instances of sexual violence aren't you know aren't prosecuted aren't fully gone you know <laughs> another reason why people won't um won't disclose because they think there's no point in going through the criminal justice system because again they don't think they're going to be believed so it has a huge effect on the young people that i work with we do a lot of work around um self-esteem um and trying to understand like and there's a lot of i'm sure a lot of people here can identify with they understand it you know if if a friend if the same thing happened to a friend they would know oh that's silly that wasn't her fault but because it's them they go oh it was my fault you know <laughs> so um we do a lot of kind of talking around that but um yeah it's uh it's it's a real big part of the work that I do and it's heartbreaking when people have these ideas or if I hear somebody say something like that look you know lord help them <laughs> so yeah um thank you um and I know we spoke about this briefly in um, our podcast that we've recorded and I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end, but um, we spoke about kind of the school's management of victim blaming and what happens when an incident uh, for a young person is disclosed at, at school. Can you talk a little bit about how school's best intentions perhaps of managing a situation just kind of perpetuates the problem of, of victim blaming? Absolutely. I mean, I do in with some regards. So I do work with a lot of schools and I'm working with a couple at the moment where there's both the perpetrator and the survivor in the same school. And I do sympathise with them to a degree because that's a really difficult position to be in with regards to safeguarding, with regards to knowing how to keep everybody safe and knowing how to keep, you know, keep everybody happy. Um, so I do sympathise with them a little bit, but generally speaking, they don't really know what to do. Um, and every single case is incredibly individualised. There's not, it's quite difficult to be like, right, okay, do this, 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 and this. This is what will fix the problem. It's, you know, you really have to look at um, the individual situation. Some schools and colleges are fantastic. They'll have, you know, separate, separate entrances and exits for, you know, the young person and the perpetrator. They'll be, you know, they will... Um, you know, bring things to uh, the police as and when needed um, and support that young person. Others are just, they just don't, they either just don't believe the young person and the young person doesn't feel heard. And if that's maybe the first person they've disclosed to, they're never going to tell anyone again because they think, well, that was a trusted adult and that trusted adult, you know, has made me feel like absolute rubbish. Um, and yeah, there's just, there's lots of ways that a school can handle it quite badly, unfortunately. And that's, a real shame I don't think it's necessarily their fault I think it's a lack of training and again that's something we we try and assist with um and it's it then make it then also um creates kind of a, a culture within the school something that we've had quite a lot of recently is young women disclosing not feeling like a school has handled it very well and then actually a group of say 20 one of them's actually about 30 of them coming to us saying this is happening in our school 
nothing's being done about it what can we do so they're actually act you know 17 18 year olds reaching out to a third party to try and get some assistance which again is heartbreaking that they feel like they have to do that um, but of course we're very much there for them and and we go in and we listen and we have sort of groups and 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 sort of take it from there um, but yeah it's very varied it depends on the school some school like I said some schools work with us really really well another school I think I gave you this example before MJ where I um I did a mail shock so we do consent work in schools anyway and I did a mail shot to all the local schools and one was an all boys school and they <laughs> messaged me going are you sure we need this and we're like yeah yeah it's for all genders it's for everybody yeah <laughs> so um yeah it just goes to show there's lots of different different ways to think about it <laughs> thank you sophie um i'm kind of gonna move on to jocelyn um sort of bouncing off of what sophie said um i, I guess i'm keen to kind of hear perhaps uh, your opinions on, on what support is lacking for young people um, and and perhaps some of that, what, you know, what have young people, the young people you work with identified as lacking or they wish that they'd ha have had in, in their education or um, perhaps outside of their e education. So a little bit of kind of what, what support is lacking for those young people? Mm, um, thank you so much, Sophie, but it was really great to hear your work and what you do and the impact of it, which I'm sure is huge for the young people that you support and the schools, because schools is also a big, huge issue um, in, in regards to kind of the context of where sexual violence can happen for young people. Um, but also I think for me, it's about us thinking about all the different contexts. So as you can imagine, when we think about Borg, violence against women and girls, um, that comes up quite a lot with the young women and girls that we support because when they're being criminally exploited, it's not just thinking about, you know, drugs that they're trafficking. It's also the sexual violence that they experience, the domestic violence, the peer on peers, all of those things. Um, and I think one of the big things, a few, there's quite a few things, but um, most recently just having some time with um, some of our consultants and some of the young women listening to their stories and hearing, you know, especially when we think about Borg, it tends to be from a professional standpoint, we always view it with a male perpetrator and a female victim. And looking at it from that, that kind of very heteronormative lens and binary actually creates a lot of issues for a lot of our young women that are going through really complex abuse. Um, sometimes they're experiencing physical abuse, sexual abuse, um, emotional abuse, physical abuse from other women and girls. And not all of them are from the LGBTQI plus community. So it makes that experience even more complex. So I think also having services and professionals um, be a lot more aware of the heteronormative stance that Wall tends to have and opening it up and being a bit more holistic um, and inclusive in our language to encourage disclosure. Um, because when you look at reports, especially around criminal exploitation and same-sex violence, there's hardly any in the UK. It's hardly any reports or statistics. And you know, Gallup are doing an amazing work, Gallup, who look at domestic violence from the LGBTQI community, doing amazing research around that. But there's, there's hardly any, which means for our young women, they don't really feel like they're in safe spaces to talk about some of that complex abuse. Um, I think also, <sighs> there's so many things, but also understanding the context of where harm can happen. So there's, you know, a lot of people are talking around contextual safeguarding and thinking around actually that a young person can experience harm and violence in lots of different contexts and the relationships that they have in those different contexts can be quite fluid. Um, which means the harm can be quite fluid. And so that basically means that every single adult needs to be aware that we should all be safeguarding every child that we see, every child that's in our vicinity, every child that's around us, we have a duty of care for them. Um, and a lot of our young people tend to, um, they gave some feedback around services and they felt that what was lacking in terms of their experience when trying to access support or to be heard is compassion. Um, people not offering compassion, being quite desensitized, the inherent kind of internalized patriarchy and um, internalized misogyny and victim blame that young people have, they're feeding off of that from other caregivers and other people, ex extra familial caregivers they see us as, they, co they coined that for us in our focus group. Um, they, you know, they're, in, they're receiving that from us because we're not asking the right questions. We're making assumptions about their experience. We're not looking in the context of where harm is happening. Um, and because we work within criminal exploitation, when you think about exploitation, the actual definition, you know, it's around when somebody has an imbalance of power 
where they've been controlled or coerced or manipulated or forced to do something. Um, and so in the context of the criminal justice system, we have a lot of young people, especially now, um, young women being criminalized because of criminal charges off the back of their criminal exploitation, but actually people are not thinking about the violence the coercion, the, 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 the control that's informed that experience. And so um, another thing people need and young people need is also from, from everywhere, from services, social services, statutory services, criminal justice systems, to be able to understand that when a young person is being exploited, that they are victims first and being able to understand the context of where that harm is happening. Um, we have a lot of our young women that aren't really accessing the right culturally appropriate services. They're not around. Um, you know, and when we think about sexual violence from a contextual safeguarding lens and also from a criminal exploitative lens, um, you know, we know in the statistics there are lots of Black and Asian young people that are disproportionately represented in those statistics, but why? It's because they're marginalised um, and they're coming from boroughs and homes where access to the same standard of education, healthcare, finances, employment, all of that isn't there. So they're more likely to be vulnerable to being criminally exploited, like looked after children, all of those things. Um, but we are also not thinking about if a young person experiences violence and harm off the back of exploitation and then they're going to sit with a professional who knows nothing about their cultural or faith or racial background and the context of that because that will feed into their experience that creates a huge barrier for young people to really fully disclose what's happening to them to build trust to engage um, and that's a huge issue for us um, big big issue um, we know that there are some smaller projects starting up you know we're one of them on Naked Truth providing support where we can um, to black women, but we're a small project um, and there's so much work to be done. Um, most young people have really bad experiences of CAMS when we're thinking about trauma-informed services, um, which is really important for young people who have been exploited and experiencing harm. You know, we need more trauma-informed services and the services that they're accessing aren't trauma-informed. So the approach is different. They're not thinking about actually when this young person is exhibiting anger uh, and fighting back, that that's a trauma-informed response. That's not that young person trying to be belligerent or aggressive, um, that needs to change. We need more trauma-informed services and actually trauma-informed services that embody the values of trauma-informed, not just saying it. Like, how do you respond as a service to the harm that young women and, and, and girls are experiencing? Um, and I think there's so many things that need to change, MJ. Like, we could talk about this for hours. I'm like, ah, so many things. But I also feel like that you know, Developing a critical consciousness with young people around their experiences is really important. So they can unlearn the shame, they can unlearn the conditioning from a place of power and be able to, because when we think about sustainable behavior change, it's not just like, okay, if I no longer go to Coventry where I was being sexually exploited, that reduces all the risk and I'm gonna be fine. It's like, no, actually, why, did, why were you going to Coventry? What informed that experience? What level of control were you experiencing? How was your upbringing informing that? All of that, developing a critical consciousness so a young person can reflect on their experience is really important in terms of them being able to reclaim a sense of power and agency and understanding about what's gone on. So then they can transmute that into a place of, I now know how to make positive choices for myself to keep myself safe. I now know that I am worth more. I now know that um, I've got options. I now know that I'm, and powerful. These are all the things that will inform a young person to have sustainable behavior change. So I think that is really important. Um, that's a big part of the work that we do at Abianda. We, we talk to our young people. So we do a lot of casework, so one-to-one -one casework with those young people, as well as advocating for them with services and wherever they need us really. Um, and a big part of the work is developing a critical consciousness around anger, power, trauma, harm, sexual violence, um, services, their human rights, um, what does it mean to be advocated for? What does it mean to self-advocate? What does it mean to advocate for a peer? All of those things and developing a critical consciousness in each of those areas. Um, and for us, and from what I've been able to see and benefit from just watching my amazing colleagues doing the work with the young women, is seeing how trans transformative that is and how that is actually what helps to reduce harm and risk when a young person's able to understand what's happened and why that's happened. And actually it wasn't their fault. And there's so many things that inform that, like patriarchy, systemic inequality, structural oppression, um, racism, sexism, misogyny, 
you know, there's so many things that inform their experience. Um, and it's so important for them to fully understand that. So I would love to see more organizations kind of adopting that approach. And it sounds like the Oxford, Oxford Race, um, Rape Crisis Center is doing some of that anyway, um, but just critical consciousness, not just around how we stop it, but thinking about how, how, we, how are we empowering these young people, not by just saying it, but what tools are we supporting them to identify in themselves? They've got innate resources um, and that's really important. So many things, MJ. <laughs> I think also having more spaces um, for young people to have holistic conversations around their experiences in a safe place where they can be with other peers who may share their intersections of maybe gender, race, um, sexuality, but then also being able to have some of that um, uh, I guess into gender work that may happen where you can bring other um, male identifying people and non-binary people and um, female identifying people into the same space. And I think that that is where we also need to get to, but before we get there, we need more safe spaces for, for every young person to be around peers of the same gender and intersection so they can share their experience safely, develop that critical consciousness and then be able to come together to have a holistic conversation. So it's not these conversations that are just happening over there. Um, that's really important. And I think it's, it's really important for us as adults um, to be really aware of just how complex young people's lives are and how um, difficult it is for them to navigate especially now, like I'm 37 this year, I'm kind of on the cusp of being a millennial, but not really, um, proper analog girl, so it's all a lie. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, I am flabbergasted when I have conversations with my niece and nephews around their experiences and what they see, what they have access to, um, the blurred lines of consent and abuse and violence that happens within their social circles, that happens within the community, that happens in their schools. Um, and I think sometimes as adults, we're looking for those hard and fast rules and those hard and fast clues of what's happening. Um, so I think it's really important that we are talking to young people and listening and learning from their experiences to know actually abuse and violence can look very different and it can be really gray and really blurry. Um, and it's up to us to support those young people to be able to understand that actually that it doesn't need to happen to you. That's not your fault. Um, you can say no, you deserve to say no. There's power in that. You can access support here, um, especially around like when we think about the safeguarding that needs to kind of happen around the online space. And it's, it's, it's wild. 14 year old girls getting unsolicited dick pics sent in their DMs and being groomed on Snapchat and Instagram. Um, you know, sex trafficking rings being moved from recruiting girls on, on Snapchat and then moving them onto WhatsApp to contact them. Like, and parents aren't aware of this. Us as adults, we're not fully aware of this because it seems so far away from our, from our reality, but it's so important um, to be having these conversations with young people around how they're sharing information. When you're seeing a 14 year old girl who's got 15,000 followers on Instagram, actually sitting with them, who are they? Do you know who these people are? How are, they, how are you engaging with them? Helping them develop a, a critical consciousness around actually what's safe for me here? Who should I be contacting? Um, how should I be communicating with people? I think, you know, as adults, we've got a lot of tooling up to do. A lot of tooling up to do. There's so much work that needs to be done. Um, and I also think just making sure when we're thinking about support for young people, um, with all the young women that we support at Beyond and also the young women, I work, the women that I work with at Our Naked Trues, they're all trauma informed. So having access to therapeutic interventions is really important as well. Um, and making sure we're thinking about that. We're working with young people in any space and we're working with other services and putting together holistic care plans for them. Are we thinking about therapeutic intervention? Doesn't always have to be CAMS. There are other services that we could also be involving in that process. Um, so we're thinking about reducing harm. We also need to think about how that young person is gonna process what's happened to them in a safe way, you know, yeah. Could go on and I hope that's okay um it's I hope so what I've said is okay incredible Jocelyn and just so much to kind of think about and 
Um, I've got so many more questions, but I, I'm also aware that we've got um, a, a very short amount of time. But um, if anyone at any point has any questions that they want to ask Jocelyn or Sophie, um, please pop them in the chat and we will have um, a short Q&A um, and it would be really nice to hear from some of you. Um, but I'm going to uh, go to Deanna now. Um, and ask you kind of as an artist, I mean, you sort of touched on it uh, a little bit in, in your intro, but as an artist, creative and a mother, like obviously listening to Jocelyn about kind of Snapchat and all of that. And I was like, oh, oh goodness, uh, you know, as a mother too, um, you know, it's it true, it's true, Jocelyn, and it resonated with me because I was like, I do not know enough about kind of these the online kind of safety of, of young people. Um, but so Deanna, I'm, I think I'm really interested in what was it about this project that really resonated with you and, and kind of made you want to be involved? Okay, um, well, like listening to Sophie and Jocelyn, yeah, just incredible and similar to what you're saying, MJ, like just so much, just like, yeah, just looking at kind of that, the massive scope in which these things take place and like being aware of my own lens um, and especially that critical consciousness that Jocelyn mentioned which um, I hadn't I haven't heard that phrase before um, and it's something that I'm definitely taking away um, and I think has always been in not always that's a lie but like has become a very strong part of my practice um, with working with young people and um, I worked with them in poetry but that to me was um, a route into figuring out lots of things that were going on as a teenager and um, that were um, complex I guess and, and and didn't find a space of any organisation or adult and so poetry for me has been that space to kind of untangle a lot of like the normal human stuff that people go through and what families go through and friendships and the things that you bear witness to as well, which is where I came to with this commission um, and was very aware that um, that my relationship to sexual violence in many respects has been to bear witness to my friends' experiences. And so was very conscious of not, not wanting to appropriate those experiences in any way, shape or form. Um, and, but then recognizing that I had to look at a relationship that was very not not nice as my daughter would say not nice um and 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 use this space for that for that understanding and that critical consciousness that I had been doing it was a long time ago that I had been doing in terms of the agency and empowerment and being able to look at that experience and see my decision making process within it and where those decision-making processes stemmed from in the myths and stories and narratives I'd been fed from wider society, but also what I grew up with and what my value was. And, and, and so this was, yeah, a, a, it just kind of felt like the time had come to... Um, to twist that, to use poetry, I hadn't been able to write about it at all, um, bar one poem. Um, and even then that was in third person. And so, uh, so yeah, it just felt like the time had come. I am a mum now and I'm in a very safe space, safe relationship where like, I see what love is and can be and how to give it and how to hold, um, difficult intense conversations without them spiraling into violence um, and without being coerced um, into behaviors or or like stopped from 
experienced in my life and the way that I wanted to live in and so um so I yeah I like I like listening to the signs as um and like just trusting my instincts and my instinct said this one is this is this is gonna you're gonna be all right doing this and um and I was, and I remember we had a conversation, we had a few conversations, which is always good when you're collaborating with people. And I love collaborating with people. It's a big part of me as a writer, kind of getting a brief and wrestling with it and then kind of sharing it back and saying, what do you think? Is this what you had in mind? And especially because it was working with film and choreography and, and so ensuring that it wasn't just my experience that was being centred, even though I was writing it, but that I was writing it removed from myself but connected if that makes sense so that other so that it opened up space onto into what I saw as um the gray area of abuse and sexual violence and um and coercion and just not niceness <laughs> um and wanting to like really look at that in lots of different ways um, which, yeah, I guess, I don't know, I'm, like, I guess because it was coming from real life examples, it was quite easy to find those snippets and also recognise, which I think things like I May Destroy You have been really great for this, like recognise the different forms these things happen in that like previously I just, there was no, I have no language. It's just like, oh yeah, that happened and whatever. It's like, no, that was real bad and you know it was real bad but you just didn't have a space to like make sense of it or even see it as like a, a, a complete violation of my rights or anyone's rights, do you know what I mean? And I think, yeah, I'm, I'm learning that language now as to <laughs> like, these things shouldn't happen. <laughs> like they just shouldn't happen. They're not part of a relationship, they're not, and so yeah it was it's been a it's been a big journey and I'm still unraveling and unpacking and also checking myself and when I haven't necessarily been the best friend or best ally because I haven't been able to see what these things are because of my own bullshit lens <laughs> you know what I mean and so just like not gouging my eyes out but you know just ripping all these filters off so that I can just be like actually keep, yeah blah 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 but yeah, so it's been it's it's been a journey, and I'm really grateful for the space to be able to yeah do it professionally, I guess. Um, which yeah is obviously with a small family <laughs> being able to being able to be paid to explore these things is really great because sometimes I don't find time to check in with myself, and so thank you, Diana. Um. um and you'll get to hear uh, Deanna's words in our preview uh, that we are showing right at the end of this event. Um, and I just kind of bouncing off of that, I, I feel like there is there is so much kind of weight and importance in, uh, as Jocelyn said, using other alternative therapeutic methods. So, you know, uh, through writing or through drama or through art um, and using that as, as a tool, it feels like there's, there needs to be more focus on that um, uh, and, and offered to more young people as, as alternative methods. Certainly kind of in my experience, for some young people, it's just easier to kind of tap into those artistic expressions rather than sitting, you know, face to face with a, a count, the school counsellor or, or things like that. So um, thank you, Deanna, for, for being part of this project and for sharing, um, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, we have a little bit of time now um, to uh, have a short Q&A. Um, so if anyone kind of has any questions, please pop them in the chat. We'd love to uh, ask our lovely panelists before they have to leave um, any questions that you have, anything that's kind of been brought up, anything you want clarification on, um, please uh, get typing now. Um, I've got uh, a couple um, so Jocelyn, uh, someone's asked, you mentioned EMDR as an alternative to CBT. What is EMDR? Um, it is. 
eye movement desensitization recognition therapy. And so what it does is it's all, it's really good. It actually came, it was actually derived from working with people that had experienced PTSD. And so the whole method is to sit with a practitioner, um, say you bring up a particular experience of trauma um, and they're gonna watch to see what your eye movements, do, your eye movement does. Because mm. it's very about kind of looking at somatic movement and kind of how your body responds to trauma. Because they're very good at armoring. So you could be experiencing trauma, but then be presenting with a smile on your face because you're trying to repress your emotional response. So you, but your eyes don't lie. And if you, and you've got a good practitioner, they'll know what to do. So they will watch your eye movement. And then they'll, when they get to a place of being able to see your eyes moving quite rapidly, they'll get you to hold that. So that you will stop talking. And then they'll basically just be sitting in quiet space, watching to see what your eyes are doing as you're processing or revisiting that trauma. And then they'll get you to, they'll ground you in the practice and then get you to kind of talk about what that process was like. And then you, you go through a series of discussion around maybe some coping mechanisms around that process. But first it's about really being able to be centered in it and being able to bring you back into your body while you're experiencing it. So you're not completely separate from body and mind when you're experiencing it. Um, and that's a really clumsy way of explaining it. I've not had the benefits of it. Um, I've not experienced it, sorry, to, to, to know the full benefits. But um, I know a lot of people that have. And it was really important when I was learning about EMDR and seeing how transformative it was um, for people who had experienced, um, you know, really complex trauma. Um, it's amazing. So definitely, if anyone's interested, have a look, have a bit of a Google. There's loads on YouTube to talk about the process and what it's like. And if you want to try it, um, some people say that they, they um, practice EMDR, but you need to make sure they're accredited to practice EMDR. It's not something you can just learn online. Um, you need to be accredited to do it because you are moving people through trauma. So you have to know what you're doing. Um, yeah, there was that. Thank you. Hope that helps whoever asks. Um, and I mean, this, I feel like this is a, a whole evening in itself, but I'm going to ask this question uh, before we wrap up. Um, and this is to, to Sophie, Deanna, Jocelyn. Um, you know, obviously when we talk about these issues of abuse, and so, uh, society seems to focus on, on women and girls' experiences. Um, and it's, it seems to be that it's women and girls talking about these issues. Um, in your experience and, and your work, how do you go about engaging and including men and boys in these conversations? Um, anyone? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite difficult, I think, because so many of them are almost not frightened, but like, um, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure, I don't know what, sure, what I'm trying to say, but so, so as an example, I did, went and did a careers week thing, um, and we um, are looking to employ, hopefully eventually, a male outreach worker, um, and we do support men in our adult services, we just haven't started doing that in our young person service because we're still a relatively new project and we're really, really tiny, there's literally two of us right now, um, so it, it does need developing. Um, but I did that in a careers week and I think, and I was more than happy and, and kind of going, come on, let's go, let's talk about this thing. And I think they were just, a, they were just really reluctant to kind of come over and, and talk about it. And um, yeah, it's really difficult um, to try and get them to engage sometimes, I think, but it's difficult because there's, so uh, going back to the example of the school that I'm sort of working with. Um, so we had, uh, the, you know, like I said, 30 young people all coming to the same, right, we need to do action, we need to do something about this. And it was all girls and non-binary people. And um, and I said, why aren't there any boys here? And they said, because we were told we're not allowed, we weren't allowed to, because the school would, were trying to give a platform to young women and non-binary people, which is good. And that's what we want to do. But also it does involve literally everybody. So I was kind of querying that and saying like, well, for the next one, if there are boys that you know that are interested in coming and getting, you know, because I think um, a lot of what Jocelyn said in a much more eloquent and lovely way, people listen to who they identify with, right? In a lot of regard. Um, and, you know, I think, and I think that there are apparently, according to them, there was lots of young boys who wanted to come, but just weren't mm -hmm. able to because the school were kind of in a backhanded kind of way trying to, you know, again, trying to raise young women's voices up. So, um, yeah, it, it, I think it's really, really important to involve men and young boys in this conversation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because they're just, you know, I know that reports aren't necessarily reflective of what's actually going on um, because of patriarchy. Um, so which is again like you said a whole conversation in itself um, 
so yeah I think I think it'd be great to get more of them involved um and yeah absolutely <laughs> um I'm gonna stop there because we are um running close to time um and I know that Jocelyn has to go and uh, uh it's all right I managed to um ensure that I could be here till half eight much um but just to let uh the rest of the audience know um we have um recorded two uh episodes uh, podcast episodes um featuring sophie um and jocelyn and ebenita and some amazing young people um and uh podcast so this conversation will, it continues on the podcast. There's more information, there's more resources, and there's more of these uh, incredible women talking um, about kind of the brilliant work that they are doing um, right now in the community. So um, please follow us on, on social media because that will be um, released uh, hopefully very soon. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Um, so thank you, uh, Sophie, Diana, and Jocelyn for being part of this panel discussion. I think for me, uh, as I said previously, it's important to, to keep having these conversations, to keep um, uh, informing ourselves and, and, and providing a platform where other people get to kind of know about the brilliant kind of resources that are out there, about the organizations that you're working for, and, and hopefully, um, you know, to empower more women and girls to signpost other people to access those services themselves. Um, it's been great having you here. So thank you so, so much uh, for being part of it. And finally, just a few sort of specific thank you. So Deanna, Sophie and Jocelyn, who's had to uh, leave, thank you for a really informed panel discussion. Um, I hope for the rest of the audience, there was some, some really useful uh, uh, kind of tidbits of information or things really resonated or things that you might perhaps take home and discuss with other people. We want to, this conversation to continue. Um, so thank you, um, three of you, for being part of that and for fueling that conversation. Um, uh, thank you to uh, Omnibus Theatre for letting us take over your engine room event. Um, yeah, it's been a real pleasure kind of pulling everything together and, and for us kind of getting to see some of you it, it virtually, yay! Um, but also to uh, share kind of our journey of what we've been working on over the past kind of six um, pandemic -y more months. Um, so it's really exciting to be putting kind of new work out into the ether. Um, uh, so yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you to everybody who has attended tonight. Um, I wish I could give you all a, a big hug, <laughs> but hopefully soon. Uh, um, if anyone has any, any questions or any further thoughts, um, please uh, follow us on social media, drop us a message. Um, and we're happy to share kind of um, more information about Jocelyn and the organization she works with and Sophie um, and, and Oswark and the organization that she works for. So if you want more information and you want some more resources, we will we'll happily signpost you to those organizations. I'll stop talking now. Enjoy the rest of your Monday evening um, and hopefully we'll see you all in person very, very soon. <laughs>